Hi, Vlad. Uh, how your ra last name is actually pronounced? So Vlad is obvious. What's your last name? What's name? How your last yes, name is last pronounced? Yeah. Yes, my last name is uh, Mihalcha. Mihalcha. So the, mm -hmm. the, the, Mihalcha, yeah. Three syllables. Mihalcha. Mihalcha. And, so, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Sounds, uh, sounds not that hard. Um, so what was your first computer? It's the most important question. Yes, my first computer was a Romanian-made computer at the time. It was called uh, HC, home computer. It was, mm -hmm. um, I don't remember exactly the specifications, but it, it's, I think it's uh, 40 or 50 kilobytes of RAM and... Uh, uh, it could uh, it could run QBasic programs, mm -hmm. which I tried a little bit back then. Uh, that was uh, late 80s, the beginning of 90s, something like that. And we were playing some video games. Uh, I still remember some some of some of them. We were loading them using uh, cassettes or yeah. audio cassettes. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, question: uh, a Romanian computer was it like you uh, know C64 or ZX Spectrum knockoff, or was it like you know uh, origin Romanian invention? No, no, it was uh, something like, exactly like, uh, like I think it was, uh, it was built after some uh, other computers that were available also in Western Europe or something like okay. that. It's it, uh, it, because they were not building the chips, or maybe they were building, but it was with the license, so it's still okay. something like uh, the same architecture, you know? Yeah, yeah. and which X80, architect? Eight eighty six, something like that. Oh, I think it was like, uh, yes, it was. Uh, I think it was like that. I don't really remember. So it was exactly almost what, what almost a PC or or a Pentium compatible, right? Uh, well, not uh, no, not Pentium. <laughs> uh, Intel. I, I mean, Intel compatible. I, I think it was more like something like uh, uh, it, it was it, it was not even as powerful as two eight six or something like no, that. No, no, no. It was probably like zero eight six or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that the first was on eighty eighty six from Intel. So I think it was this. And why I'm asking is because uh, I assumed, you know, the computer was like uh, earlier, ZX Spectrum or C64, which had nothing to do with the Intel architecture. But you started actually with more or less Intel, the first generation or something like this, right? Well, I might be wrong. I don't even, I, I don't really remember the specification. But if I'm Googling, I can, I can tell you it for no, sure. No, just, the just, only just, thing I remember, just interesting. Yeah. So I will, I will just Google for you. It's just HC and Romania mm -hmm. and I should know. Yes, it's find H, it. yes. We, we, it's, uh, it's very interesting. I've never... Uh, I've never thought about it. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if the... I, I know that it was assembled in Romania, but I don't know if the parts mm -hmm. were imported or they were building it mm -hmm. uh, somewhere some, somewhere in Romania at the time. So I have no idea how... I, uh, I had a talk uh, with one yeah. professor in Eastern <laughs> Germany, software engineering, uh, and he told me that okay. the, uh, what the Eastern Germans did, they uh, just... Uh, they, they bought, you know, the, Eastern, uh, the Western CPUs and they try to find mm -hmm. out how, how they work and they replicate them. So I ask you because it's always an interesting story behind. But uh, yeah, okay, for our purposes, it's good enough. Uh, the question, which software ran on the computer? Was it the, like Western software or was it Romanian? Oh, no. So we, it, um, it could run basic, so it was QBasic, yeah. which I, I'm not sure. It's, it was the same everywhere. And um, I, I remember that uh, everything that we run was uh, was created uh, in the let's internationally let's say like that because there were some video games that mm -hmm. were not romanian made i remember that uh, we had them on some cassettes okay it, what was nice is that we could copy the cassette exactly <laughs> like like an audio cassette and it was still work. yeah it was still uh, would still work <laughs> yeah this is what i also did yeah. and I, I even there was a distinct sound like a modem sound and i could e even exactly. recognize fr from the sound what it was, you know. Oh, it because, starts. Yeah, it starts or not, and which game it was. So, so that, that, therefore, I'm mm -hmm. curious uh, what you actually had, because with the cassettes would imply it was not a PC-like computer, but it was earlier. So we have to no, do it some was not. No, no, it was earlier. Mm -hmm. It was, no, now I found it on, over the internet, so it was an, a, Z, uh, a Z80. Yeah, like that. you like see, Z, and I had, I had exactly the same. I had a ZX. It was not like PC. Yeah, the same, the same yeah, I, CPU architecture. Yeah. And this was not QBasic, it was just basic, as in my case. And uh, I had uh, also, so we probably played the same games. Mm, yeah, exactly like that. So now I, I found it over the internet. So it had like 32 kilobytes yeah. and uh, 64 kilobytes uh, RAM for, some, uh, for random access and uh, for the actual memory, 32 kilobytes if you want to persist something. Yeah, so in, in 60 uh, and 16 colors. <laughs> yeah, very good. So perfect machine for my, for running microservices in the clouds, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so and and you you mentioned QBasic. So you immediately started programming or were you were about gaming? 
at first it was only about games. Yeah, of course. And, uh, I, rem- <laughs> and uh, I remember that we, we took some uh, classes in school. It, uh, they were not part of the uh, the curriculum, you know. Mm-hmm. There were some uh, extra extra curriculum. So there was just some... Um, the, the school uh, knew somebody who who was working as a programmer at the time, which was very, which was extremely rare. And um, the person came and uh, taught us how to, you know, how to boot it, how to run something and how to r- write some basic uh, programs. Okay. And I remember it was basic. I, I don't remember many, uh, many things of it, but I remember that everything started with 10 leads yeah. or 20, yeah. Yeah. go to 30, yeah. <laughs> something like that. And uh, I had a book at home. And uh, we were, me and my brother, my brother and I were uh, just uh, typing the programs from that book and figuring out how, how, how they work. And my brother was always uh, attracted to design. So we were designing uh, the, with data. If you remember data, it was eight by eight. It was 256, uh, like, uh, like mm-hmm. a square, you know? Mm-hmm. So you could design s- uh, certain images with it. So my, my brother would uh, do the design, you know, on, mm-hmm. a, on a piece of paper. And then I would calculate, uh, you know, the mathematic, right, cool. uh, the, the powers of two in order to draw it on the, <laughs> on yeah. the screen. This was nice. So it was like, <laughs> it was- almost like OCR, you know, by hand. Yeah, we were building our first uh, video game at the time. Cool. How how old were you? Uh, I think I was. Uh, in, it was like fourth, fourth or fifth grade. So I think I was like ten or ten, it, eleven, twelve, something like that. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, not so incredible. <laughs> no, but it was don't, fun. don't imagine that we were doing something. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, cool. It was nothing very. It was nothing complicated. No, no, but still, no, you you did something creative, no. And and the games yeah, became yeah. became boring, or why you started, you know, by yourself designing a game? Just out of curiosity, it was it was uh, in the book. There was one program who was called the spider. Uh, the spider is walking, or something like that. Or mm-hmm. and it, it had a spider, and you could control it uh, using the key arrows, you know. Okay. And we wanted to change the spider look, so we changed it with something, and then we draw. We draw like uh, a circuit. We we draw a car, and then we wanted to draw and to to drive it on a circuit, you know, yeah. on a circuit. And then uh, we couldn't uh, we we couldn't make it, uh, you know, beep if you go outside of the track, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was complicated at that time. Yeah. We wanted to do that. We wanted to build something like a car video game with a car, so you, you have to follow a certain track. And if you cannot, and if you go outside of the track, mm-hmm. it will uh, do something to tell you that yeah. it's not good. <laughs> And you and you got the pick and pokes back then. Do you remember pick and poke the game? Pick and poke. No, I remember. No, no, no. Pick and poke. There were there were there were basic commands with poke. Oh, no, you could po- you could set the memory uh, address and with speak okay. you could read that. And this is really? so basic. Yeah, like basic was somehow easy for me, but a pick and poke it was mm-hmm. like technology from hell because you had to knew, know the architecture from the from the CPU, which I didn't knew back then, and I just mm-hmm. wondered how you know. I don't could, think. How the program is new that uh, or the, at the address, let's say 10,000, and if you set to 255, something will beep or something like that. So, And regarding the line yeah, numbers, I think... what I also remember mm-hmm. is in one part of time, I don't think was it was set in Spectrum or later, um, in BASIC, the first design pattern was actually not do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, rather than 10, 20, mm-hmm. 30, 40, because I could always, you know... Uh, put an or insert a line in between so i was really proud of the invention yeah. that, <laughs> that you can actually yeah uh, yeah and and you remember go sub or go to so um and go, we, to. Go, go to only go to I yeah, I, I, yeah yeah i know i was farther i was the design guru so what i did i used go sub so go sub <laughs> is like it goes to a line and comes back it was you know the beginning of methods oh. yeah you see Oh, I, I don't think I use that. Yeah, we should we should we should register a talk, you know, uh, uh, design patterns and talk about basic just for fun. This would be actually nice. Yeah, ba- uh, a book. Uh, yeah, a book. A book. Okay, yeah. <laughs> serverless basic, something like this. Okay. In the cloud. <laughs> In the cloud, of course. Without cloud, uh, I mean. Cloud native. Yeah. <laughs> cloud native basic. <laughs> exactly. So, um, what happens afterwards? So, uh, first, you, the game was it fun? So, have you completed the game or? What happened with the game? And what was the name of the game? This is always interesting. I, I don't think we even had the name. I think we, it, it, we, we never launched it. it. It was only a beta game. Okay. <laughs> so we never, we, we, we never got the chance to, to finish it or to just uh, to accomplish all the goals that yeah. uh, we had in mind. So it's, uh, in a way, it was a beta because we, we, we couldn't uh, reach all the goals that we wanted mm-hmm. for the, okay. let's say, 
version 1.0. <laughs> okay. So what happens afterwards? So, so, so yes. you kept programming or you no? Know, what happens then? No, no. Actually, afterwards, I didn't do anything related to programming. So when I, um, I went to high school, Mm-hmm. And uh, I uh, I got into uh, mathematics and physics uh, wow, class cool. mm-hmm. because there were yeah there were, there were two classes like programming informatics programming classes but I didn't got the the my admission score was below oh or be, 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 and so I I didn't get to that so I got to, to a mathematics and physics uh, class so I learned a lot about mathematics and physics at the time mm-hmm. and uh, when um, uh, and when you I enjoyed decided that? to go to college, yes, I really, I, I liked that uh, very well. Well, not ma- math, ma- math, math was just math, but I really liked physics okay. a lot. Okay. And I wanted to do something uh, with it. I mm-hmm. had no intention to do uh, programming or software because we learned, we, we also learned some some basic uh, mm-hmm. programming also in high school. Like I remember we learned Fox Pro and uh, yeah. basic again, mm-hmm. uh, again, basic and um what was uh, and, and just you know the basic uh, and uh, pseudo code and uh, you know the basic uh, concepts of uh, what's behind uh, in you know imp- imperative programming or something like that how mm-hmm. how you should uh, think the program and that was pretty much it I, I was not very attracted uh, attracted to it because we are just solving mathematical problems using uh, of course using programming which was not very fun at the time yeah and uh, I thought I I couldn't envision what exactly I was supposed to do if I would work as a software developer because it didn't uh, uh, look uh, very attractive to me. And at the time, it was not a very popular yeah. um, job. So I, I think I only knew one or two persons who were working uh, uh, in the industry. And I think they were just operating uh, some pro- already built programs or something like that. Okay. And, and uh, where was so, it? In Bucharest? Yeah. No, I was I, no, no. I I was born in Constanza. It was at the on the Black Sea coast. Oh, nice. That's where I I was born, and that's where I uh, grew up. Okay. Um, and then when I go when I went to college, I went to telecommunications because at the time, uh, mobile phones were very popular. Okay. So that's why I I, I thought that okay, so uh, that one might be something that's worth uh, worth learning or doing. It looks uh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Uh, mobile phones uh, as they came out. For me, it was completely confusing yeah. because everyone was really excited about the cellular phones and they, they build antennas to cars and whatever. And I just, for me, it was boring. So it was like, what do you why? do with this? this so for, it, it was not really understandable for me why everyone is excited about the cellular phones because for me, it was like a phone, but smaller. Okay, I can take it with me, but you, you couldn't do anything useful with it except, you know, send an SMS message or, or, or call someone, which I could do anyway, right? You were excited mm-hmm. about the cellular revolution, late nineties. Yeah, they were very. They actually got very, very popular. Yeah, they got uh, in, my, but, 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 uh, in my country, <laughs> and uh, maybe in some other parts uh, of of the world as well. And I think it was just you know the fact that you could you could just call and uh, uh, meet your friends wherever wherever you are. You could just uh, find them and uh, do something. So you'd ha- you because with a fixed phone, you have to go home. You know, yeah, yeah. and or 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 have the, those cards, you know, and uh, use a public uh, phone to to call somebody. But it was not always. Uh... So I think it was something that allowed you to be more spontaneous about uh, your yeah. life and do this is what all, I got. all sorts of things. This is and what it was I got. A gadget, you know. It's... Yeah, yeah, but mm-hmm. the gadgets were boring. This is what I got, of course. But uh, you know, uh, in uh, my colleagues, they always talk about cellular phones, they functions, and there were actually basically no functions. So the first phone which I was yeah. excited about mm-hmm. was the Nokia Communicator, where I can open it, and this was almost mm-hmm. like a computer. But every, all other phones, I was completely not interested because they were just boring, you know. Yeah, yeah. This yeah was like, you know, like a cal- like a calculator for me, and everyone was excited about the phones, which phone to choose, which contracts, antenna in their cars. It was like you know rocket science. And for me, it's so, okay. This is more or less a walkie talkie. I get it. But uh, then it became mm-hmm. more interesting with the smarter phones. I would say a little bit later, right? Yeah, that was uh, ten years, ten ten years afterward. And, yeah, no, um, not exactly. They were yeah, you know, the Nokia. That, 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 the Nokia was smart, and the Palm Pilots. You mm-hmm. remember Palm Pilots? Palm, yeah, I, from HP. Yes, yes, I, no, not I HP. remember. No, not HP. It was the company Palm, and then was bought by HP. It yeah. was Palm. Yeah, it was it like was small. Mm-hmm. It looked like, I would say. Uh, I only saw it. Uh, okay. I only saw it over the internet. I never, I never had the one or played with. Uh, this was actually interesting one. part. Okay, so um, but uh, 
you, you started to study telecommunication, what I got, right? Yes, that's exactly. I started, I, start, uh, I went to, I went to Bucharest and that's where I, uh, I got into electronics and telecommunications. So I did the first year and afterward in my second year, I moved to Cluj because I didn't like it in Bucharest. Mm -hmm. If you ever been to Bucharest, you would understand. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, yeah, you've been to Cluj, so you yeah. already know why it's, it's much, uh, it's, um, I, I liked it. I, I liked it better. <laughs> I was, um, so, uh, in, in, I was in, uh, Bucharest, which is a big city. So mm -hmm. as any other big city, but, uh, I was at a conference there and, uh, there was mm -hmm. a great coffee. So I walked, you know, around the conference center and this was a coffee shop and the coffee shops were excellent. They were, you know, very, very yeah. good. And what I did last year, I got a question whether I could, you know, uh, do some consulting in Brashov. You know Brashov? I think I pronounced mm -hmm. right. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, and, and that's to, where my grandma is from. So I know to get to Brashov is uh, is a challenge. So what I did, I think I flew to Bucharest, then pick a car mm -hmm. and, and 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 went to Brashov over the mountains. And I would say yeah, after yeah, yeah. after twenty thirty kilometers, it is a beautiful landscape. So I would say. I like Bucharest because, you know, outside of Bucharest, it's really nice, but I don't care about the city yes. because for me, all big cities are more or less the same. So I, I really don't care. Mm -hmm. But outside of Bucharest and, you know, what was really amazing, you know, the road between Bucharest and Brasov. It was uh, incredible. Yes, it is. Yeah. Prahova Valley. Maybe, maybe. But this was really, mm -hmm. I, and uh, I think the way to Brasov was at night. So it was really interesting. And it was in November, so I think if it starts snowing, it could be really challenging. <laughs> but um, yeah, I really enjoyed mm -hmm. it. Brasov is also a beautiful city, I think, or town, or I think it's a city. Uh, and this is a uh, yes, it is a big in, city in, in the mountains, you know. So it was, it looks almost like a James Bond movie, I would say, right? Yes, yes, it's uh, very close to to. It is very close to the mountain. Actually, it's uh, right uh, at the bottom of the uh, of a mountain. Yeah. So yes. no, you see. So mm -hmm. th th therefore, I like uh, Bucharest, and I also very like uh, Cluj. And uh, we'll talk about Cluj a little mm -hmm. bit later. But now you are in Cluj, right? So you moved to Cluj after the study or during the study? No, during during the study. Okay. I, I moved to Cluj, and uh, somehow when when I was in my third year of study, we had uh, one one class was about uh, programming, uh, Java programming, cool. and. Uh, the people, the people in the dorm told me that uh, the professor at the time, uh, his course was not uh, so well structured. <laughs> so they recommended me. Yeah, they recommended me to buy a book mm -hmm. from uh, to, to to buy a book uh, that was written by by someone who at the time was was doing his PhD and later he became the CEO of a local company. Okay. And uh, th that book was, was was very well written. And when while I was reading it, I realized, and that's when I first uh, uh, got to know about uh, object-oriented programming, about Java, and I found it very, very interesting, so much different than what I learned in high school. And actually, this was really interesting because you could design everything, really made sense, and the way you, you could uh, have every object talk to the other, encapsulate yeah. the state, I found it extremely interesting. So I started, I, I decided that I, want, I wanted to learn more by myself. So I, I just started to learn. So I bought, I bought some books. I, I, I remember I, I read uh, um, Bruce Ecker's book, uh, Thinking in Java, yeah. which mm -hmm. was huge. Mm -hmm. yeah, but actually was. after I, I, yes, after I read it, I realized that, whoa, this is uh, very interesting. I, I will really want to pursue this uh, much more. This is much more interesting than uh, what, I, what I'm uh, studying in, uh, in college. Okay. So I just started to learn everything by myself. So I just took it, uh, everything that was, so I took, I, I learned the basics of Java. Then I learned about servlets and uh, GSPs and uh, cool. Java uh, J2E at the time. <laughs> okay. And, and, and before, uh, before your study, you just knew BASIC and FoxPro, but there was no other languages between you knew, right? And Pascal. Pascal, okay. Turbo That's Pascal. what we, uh -huh. yes, uh -huh. we, we learned Turbo Pascal. Yes, we learned that uh, in uh, high school. So in high school, uh, yeah, that's exactly, we, we actually used uh, Pascal, Turbo Pascal to... Yeah, Just, uh, but Turbo Pascal we, we was actually problem. nice, right? So, I mean, I also did a little bit Turbo Pascal. It was okay. It was... Uh, yes, it was much better. It's, it was yeah. much better than basic. Yeah. But still, uh, the way that we were taught or the way that it was presented to us, the, because we were only solving mathematical problems with it, so okay. it was not very interesting at the time. I think yeah. that now when you go to school and if you teach students, you know, and you show them a UI or, you know, a web pages, 
no, it's much more attractive because it, they could do something and actually uh, they can visualize it and they can see, oh, oh look, this is exactly, I created this, you know, the, look how it looks nice. This you know, is interesting. Otherwise, it's just a console. Interesting <laughs> assumption because uh, what I think it is, uh, the problem is, you know, most of the websites and the apps, they look really nice. And if you mm -hmm. now you would start with a student in the user interface, it will look like crap first, you know, <laughs> black yeah, and white yeah, and ti Times New Roman. Yeah. So it, it and it takes yeah. a long time, you know, to to make something beautiful. So I think it would be could be even harder right now to impress students, because back then yeah. you could make you know text mm -hmm. blinking and never saw something like this because it's more like you know yeah. television set which is interactive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And right now you know the bar is so hard, uh, the, the bar <laughs> the bar is so high that uh, it is really hard to um, to impress someone. I think. Or, or the kids, they yes, already have there's, everything. Yeah, yeah, but there are so many frameworks now that you can instantly start building. You can, you yeah, you, know, you're right. you can even yeah. generate an entire website with themes and it yeah. looks amazing. Yeah, if it you're interested, you can. If yeah. I try to make it manually. Yeah. 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 yeah, so I think that, uh, you know, it, it's the thing. So when you have someone who actually doesn't know anything about it, if you, if you show them uh, how they can create something that is visual, you know, you can maybe you can spark their interest much better than yeah. if you just give them one console only uh, Linux and uh, just uh, do everything here. So it's just going to be command line, boring. Yeah, no, you're no, right. no fun. You, you're right. You, you may be. You may be right. So the, uh, it is actually the same. You can impress someone how quickly you can get into something, and if you, yeah, it's exactly the same actually. But uh, about telecommunications, what you learn in telecommunication, I had the parts of telecommunication I studied was really hard. So we learned about, you know, the waves, the, uh, the information mm -hmm. uh, theory and compression. This is what you also learned in telecommunication study? Yes, I actually, uh, that was one of my favorite uh, course, yeah. information. Uh, Komsky, uh, you know, with, Komsky, uh, with, right? With Shannon. Yeah, Shannon, with, yeah. Uh, Sh uh, Shannon. Yeah, uh, Shannon Fanon. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, you know the the laws actually uh, people in programming know very little about this, but actually he was brilliant at, uh, yeah. at, and he created uh, he created all this uh, theory behind it. Which uh, if we didn't have that, we we would not have encoding, which is used everywhere. In mm -hmm. in we we need to encode on every protocol nowadays, and we have code corrections. And uh, think about it, he actually invented it because there was nothing mm -hmm. before him. So actually, this I, I found that very interesting, and we we learn encoding, decoding, also encryption, decryption. And all sorts okay. of uh, stuff like that, code corrections. I think that was interesting. But we learned a lot of other stuff, like um, analog circuits, dig digital circuits, yeah. how to design them, uh, like televisions, uh, how you transmit uh, information over waves using uh, uh, amplitude modulation, frequency and modulation, cool. digital modulation. And you studied in Cluj? <laughs> yes. Hey, cool. Okay, cool. I, I moved even, to Cluj. I didn't even knew that uh, Cluj has a university. So, okay. It has, it's a very good one. Yeah, yeah, this is what I what I hear. But uh, I thought the the university is in 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 Bucharest and people just working. No, we, mm -hmm. we it's Romania is, is is more like Germany than France. So we have yeah we you, you, we have the capital, but then we also have uh, cities which are which have let's say that they have universities. They are they are old. They are developed. They have universities, so they are like um uh, how do I say. They are like the capital of the region, of a smaller yeah. region. Yeah. So exactly like you have in Germany. Yeah. So you have multiple, you have Munich, you have, you, 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 it's not like in France where you have Paris and then all the other cities are much smaller. Yeah, exactly. You're right. Because and there probably is Cluj. Everybody goes to Paris. There's Cluj, yeah. there, is, so uh, people, there is Brasov, there is uh, the, uh, I forgot yeah. the city where they also have a Java user group, very active one. Uh, I was told, I was never yeah, there. Yash. Yash, Yash, Krajova, there, Timisoara. Timisoara, exactly. I was invited Timisoara, several times to Timisoara, but I never had the opportunity to get there. So Timisoara and yeah, so there are lots of, uh, uh, um, yeah. So those cities actors. which are far away from Bucharest, they are also, they, they are actually the capitals of uh, some old, uh, smaller Romanian regions. Mm -hmm. And uh, they still have their universities and people who are from around the area go there. They don't necessarily have to go to Bucharest mm -hmm. because cool. they don't need to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what happened after your study? So you, st you started <sighs> to apply or what, what you worked already during your no. study? No, okay. Uh, I'm going to explain. So during my, I started this, and uh, I I had a friend who was working at um, it was a, um, a research center or something like that uh, that was uh, affiliated to the university. Mm -hmm. So uh, back at the time, I didn't have a computer, and I didn't have the money to buy a computer. Mm -hmm. So I went there because they were they would give me a computer. So and also they gave us assignments. 
uh, it was a volunteer work. We were not paid for it, but we got some assignments and then we tried to implement them mm -hmm. using Java, PHP. So that was a great opportunity to actually do some work without having like very uh, hard deadlines. We mm -hmm. had some deadlines because those were like research, some research projects. So we wanted to, um, to finish or to create something. So, so because that work would be part of someone's uh, research papers or something like that. There were some mm -hmm. prototypes for, for the people who actually, who, they were uh, working assistants in, they were assistants in, uh, at the university. So mm -hmm. actually we were helping them. But it was an opportunity. So that's where I uh, got to know more or and got to uh, practice uh, programming. And then uh, when I was in my last year of study, there was this opportunity. Someone came uh, and uh, we we talked to, to the person and uh, explained what we're doing. And he said, oh, but we are also looking for uh, programmers now. So come, come to and uh, come to an interview to see mm -hmm. to see if uh, you're 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 a good fit. That's okay. where, how I got my first job. Which with company uh, with which Java version you started? Do you remember that? Which which Java version? Yes, was? yes. It was uh, when we started. Actually, we started with one point four, but we're, there were still some projects with one point three. So okay. I remember that I used uh, both of them. I don't. I don't remember if I ever used one point two, but I. I think that the first one. I think it was one point three because that was. When I started learning mm -hmm. Java in two thousand and three, I think that was the one that you could download. Mm -hmm. And install install on your computer, and afterwards, or it was one point four. But I mean, I I don't even know where I got it because may, maybe I got it from a CD or something like that. Okay. Install it at the time. And, yeah, because we we had internet, but only uh, in the third or fourth year of study. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, we didn't have internet in in the door. Okay. And mm -hmm. uh, where you started working after your study? So actually, during my study in the last year, I started working at a company. It was, it's it's still there, and it's very close to where I'm uh, living. It's called the Rsoft Consult. Okay, and this was a consulting job, or it. or was it what what you did? It's there? like most many companies here actually do outsourcing. So okay, it was uh, a company that most of the work that we did was for various clients. Okay. My first client was uh, in a company in Israel and afterwards okay. uh, we worked for com many companies in Finland for instance. And yeah, nice. And what do you did? You pr program backends, I s assume, right? Yeah, my my first yeah, yeah, my first actually when uh in 2005 there was not uh, there was no distinction between front end and back end. Yeah. You were a Java programmer. And a Java programmer uh, had to do everything from writing queries to writing the services, uh, the controllers, the UI, uh, JavaScript, uh, mm -hmm. CSS, HTML, uh, uh, build us, uh, you know, uh, provide. Uh, we, we also had uh, some clients who require some user interface swing and uh, mm -hmm. uh, create the assembler and give them, uh, uh, you know, the final uh, uh, deploy, how to install it, write the documentation, the installer, everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So we were full stack. It was full stack. Yeah, uh, which is reasonable. Yeah. Back, it still yeah. is, I would say. Back then. Okay. It and then how, how, how long you stayed with the company? So I stayed with this company until 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, afterward, uh, I moved to some other company mm -hmm. and uh, where I stayed for another two and a half years. And then I got back to the same company. Oh. <laughs> to, the, to my first company. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because we got along very, very well. And uh, I uh, w w when I left, I wanted to see how it's I would like to, to work in some other company. It was something interesting uh, for a while, it was. And then I came back because uh, I, I really knew the people there and we actually I missed working with them. And then I stayed there another four years and then I just quit and I, I became independent. For five years, I've been just independent. And uh, whatever you did was Java, right? Mostly Java, but I also did, you know, when you are working in outsourcing, you do whatever, you know, whatever comes. You know? Yeah. <laughs> whatever the company, you know, uh, signs the contracts with some other company to develop. So, yes, I did mostly Java, but also .NET, uh, a lot of JavaScript. We uh -huh. even had some projects which were only JavaScript. Like okay. Building uh, heat maps in JavaScript and doing uh, Fourier transformations in JavaScript, interpolation, digital zooming, amazing. You can do <laughs> you can do all that. Uh, I, it was it, like in that joke, you know. Just tell me everything, and we put JS yeah. and we search it. And we find the li there is a there is a library. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That actually says that. Yeah. Um... So we were kidding. Like, there's no way we will find a Fourier transform uh, tra Fourier transformation library in uh, in JavaScript, and it's actually called it's FFT. JS. <laughs> FFT, okay. But this is where your telecommunication study paid off, I would say, right? 
in this project? Yeah, math. Yeah, math. Yeah. And uh, because I really like math. I was doing, I, I, when I was in high school, I was going to, you know, those math Olympics and physics oh, wow. Olympics. So how, how I good, really liked the, How good you were back then? Well, let's say not the best, but better than average. <laughs> yeah, cool. No, still, but Math Olympics is still amazing, you know. This is the same if you would take part, yeah, I don't I know, really in, liked in Tour de France and it will arrive. This is still amazing, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really liked that part. Okay. A lot. So I, I like both math and actually I like physics more, way more than math. But mm -hmm. actually in order to know it, you you need to know a lot of math in order to be good at physics. So somehow they were, they were always related. And... Uh, I always thought that I would uh, actually do something with that. And actually it was good because it allowed me to have a different perspective even now as a, as a software developer. From, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I, I like to say that I'm more like a software engineer than a programmer, you know, uh -huh. because I have, uh, uh, because I like to think everything that I do in more like in engineering terms, you know, of performance, how we make that, how we design it to have a good design, you know, to, to, oh, to follow some specifications. You, you remember me something. about something. There was a, a project, it mm -hmm. was 1996, I guess. It was Java Project 1997, where the Sun certified Ooh. programmer and developer things came out. And there was a, a huge German company. And in one mm -hmm. day, there was like a three hours meeting and uh, they disappeared. And I was always external. I was always freelancer and I couldn't participate in the meeting. So I, I hacked and they came back. And I asked them, yeah, what you did in the meeting? Because, you know, there are, the mm -hmm. deadlines are approaching and uh, you just disappeared for three hours. And they had meeting, you know, to talk about whether they are Java programmers or Java developers because they need, needed something for their business card. And I say, oh, the and I say, okay, but who cares? I mean, just write, you know, you are a Java, uh, I don't know, ASCII converter or whatever. Who cares about that? No, no, it's really important. And they just know. They, they spent three hours talking. I, I would really, it would be really fun to participate in such a meeting, you know, and listen, you know, about the arguments. And uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, this was actually it's politics. Yeah, it's politics. This is what I first saw. That this is strange. If you start a small company, you know, the large companies are just, uh, you have absolute no chance to compete, you know, with small dedicated team. This is what, what I saw, you know, oh, the exactly. ver yeah. very first time mm -hmm. back then, because what they also got, I told you the Palm Pilot. So Palm mm -hmm. Pilot mm -hmm. had four buttons, basically. There was like, uh, I don't know, address, and, and this was like an iPhone, but way simpler. And they mm -hmm. got one day training about Palm Pilot. I was like, okay, one day is eight hours. So you spend, you know, two hours for a button or what you can learn, you know, in, in, a, in a training about a Palm Pilot. I mean, this is way too trivial. I would understand, you know, half an hour, hour or two hours, but it's a whole day. So this was the, the first, you know, where it became mm -hmm. for me more and more funny to observe large companies. Now it's getting better, but back then it was really funny. Okay, so now two yeah. questions. Um, uh, how and why you became a freelancer? Like, I'm also a freelancer, so always interesting questions. So if you worked already for a couple of years or so five years or something, and now you become a freelancer. So why you did it and how you did That's it? That's a very good question. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I, you know, it's like I, now is the time I should put a... a Meme, meme, or how is it called? You know, with the dog or the keyboard. Uh, I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> when I started, actually, I, I didn't. I had no intention to to do that or to change the way I was working. But I had this idea to what? What, what if I start a blog? You know, and ah. write write about uh, write about the things that I found that I find interesting uh, on mm -hmm. my in, in in my daily job. So I started my my blog. I started writing, and I figured out that, that oh. Look, people are actually uh, appreciating and they actually like uh, my, let, let, let me just uh, continue. So I continued it for a while. And then after one year, I realized that <clears throat> there is a, I, I realized there is an audience for, for Hibernate, uh, you know, for, for advanced Hibernate or how to get the best out of it. So I decided that uh, I should create some course or book material. And that's exactly what it? I did. And Which year? So I started in I, I started at uh, in uh, September 2013 and for okay. the, for the first year I just uh, until 2014 I um, actually uh, that's when I realized that okay actually this is quite interesting and I should pursue it and actually I should do something uh, more than just blogging actually I could create a, my first product and see if uh, I can sell it. So then uh, in 2015, I decided to write the book High Performance Java Persistence and I realized that I would it's impossible I will never have the time. To write it, if I'm uh, if 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 I'm a full if I have a full time job, there's no way that I'm going to to mm -hmm. do that. So I decided that um, okay, in order to finish it, I'll have to just quit my job and maybe I will get some uh, maybe I'll get some part time job with some 
companies. And I had there, there was a company we were discussing. It was a company in Sweden, and we were discussing about working, but somehow we never got to uh, pass uh, through the contract phase because uh, I wanted some clauses, they wanted theirs. Nobody was willing to compromise, so we didn't get a chance to work. And uh, and afterward, after this uh, was uh, this contract didn't uh, work, uh, I was approached by uh, Red Hat. Whether I want to work uh, part time for them as a developer oh. advocate for them. Oh, so it's I didn't work. do that. So well, you worked actually for Red Hat. That's interesting. I, yes, I actually did work for them. I, I was never an employee. Mm-hmm. So I was, uh, I was, let's say, my company was doing work with Red Hat, cool. helping them with with the Hibernet project. I was still, in a way, I was still independent because it's just as a part time contract, and yeah. I was uh, also doing my. Uh, I was still uh, writing the book, and afterward I created the courses and worked on other stuff uh, as well. Do some training, uh, so or consulting for. So your for hi- so your Hibernate interests were sparked by Red Hat, or you did Hibernate before? Uh, actually, they got them, they they offered me this job because. Uh, they 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 said okay so would you like to do this also for us and actually be paid this time because okay. you've been doing it for free on your blog <laughs> okay and i said yes sure so there were, there were many things at the time that was uh, were made sense to, uh, to to let's say to to hire me for that because the the user manual was lagging behind you know the mm-hmm. versions it was still uh, it was quite stale at the time mm-hmm. and there were some uh, also, some features to be implemented so to spark uh, the interest again in the community, uh, and yes, I, I, I did that for three years. Three. So, so you were hybrid computer. Three. Yes, I, I I did a lot of uh, improvements, bug fixing, and and stuff. before Red Hat, yeah. so you had to use Hibernate because uh, of your consulting. So in all projects, they need persistence, yes. and I assume you use Hibernate, and there's where you got your experience, right? Yeah, I got. I actually I got to know it even when I wrote my. Diploma, diploma thesis, you know, in a school because I use I was doing a .NET project and I was using uh, and, N-Hibernate. and Hibernate. Okay, mm-hmm. it was and it was the the zero point eight beta version, which okay. was based on Hibernate two at mm-hmm. the time. So I got to know how that works, and then I got to know how Hibernate works when I was working at my first company, uh-huh. and then I used it for years. Then then when I started writing about it, I I knew it so well that I could actually teach people how to how to actually use it properly mm-hmm. and then when when i when i was approached by red hat i asked them oh, but do you want me to you know to give me some some interview to uh, oh no is this it's no, you don't need it you already know okay <laughs> you already proved that you know it very well so <laughs> okay cool i think you <laughs> and you still working so, yes, with red hat or no no uh no i um uh i, I worked with red hat until uh, last year Okay. March last year, so afterward, I'm, nowadays I'm just uh, independent, mostly working on my own stuff. Okay, your own stuff or your consulting projects for other clients? So are you building now products or, I, or what? No, are I'm, I'm building. I'm mostly doing only my own stuff. Sometimes, from time to time, I might do some consulting, but okay. it's, it's just very, it's very limited, like two or three days, and okay. that happens maybe one or twice. Uh, no, one or two months or something like that. One every two months or something like that. It's uh, I don't rely too much on uh, on that. So I'm mostly building my own products, like trainings. Uh, ah, now okay. I'm building a software product that I'm selling. It's called so, okay. Assistance of Software. So now the question is, uh, so you're bu- building your own stuff. So what you are building and what you are selling. So now I'm curious. So what what yeah, which product so you I'm... developed over time and which are or are there any products which are no more you know uh, available? So with which products no, all, you started? all of them are available. Okay. Yes. So what was your first product? So my first product was actually the book. The book okay. was, uh, I, I created it as a product and it is a product. I, I uh, Everything I did uh, in order to, the, the right part, the updates, uh, marketing, the sales part, everything was, I uh, envisioned it exactly like any other product. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the revenue stream, it works exactly like, uh, like any other product. It's a teaching Okay. And uh, that was my first uh, my first product. Then I created uh, the video course based on this. Uh, okay. Selling trainings, on-site trainings. No, how how long is your course. training? I'm just uh, curious. How many hours? Uh, the the high performance Java persistence training. Uh, the full the full training is uh, three days. Wow. So, so it's uh, yes, it's uh, twenty one hours. Okay. So my trainings were never that long. So uh, I, I, I always thought they are longer, but they are roughly eight hours or something usually. Okay. This is no, actually this a one is, it's quite, a lot of work. Yeah, it's quite a lot long. of work. 
Yes, it's a lot of. I, I can also do it in two days if the company is one or one day, but we just have. Ah, to wait a second. Speak. This is not an online course, right? This is just three days uh, training, which uh, you can. This del- is the the full on-site training. On-site, fact, okay. I thought this is recorded on-site. training. No. I think. No, you- no. I yeah, yeah. I also have recording courses as well. Okay. Yeah, wow. I, I'm I'm calling those video courses to mm-hmm. you know to make a separation between. Are the video you know, courses so how long know. are they? So you know what what how. Um, the the high performance uh, the mm-hmm. high performance Java persistence video training now it got to seven hours. Okay, yeah, exactly. Hours. This is what and I was. If I, if, yeah, if I if I if I record everything, I think it would be uh, like ten hours. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, okay. So it's very similar to my thing because uh, longer than that, it's it's getting you know uh, almost impossible to keep everything in head. So <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it takes it takes longer when you do it on site because you're discussing a lot of yeah, things. Yeah, and the questions uh, from the are more like almost like consulting, yeah. you know, because they ask me, okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So there's this uh, always a mix between, you know, uh, mm-hmm. no one is interested in JavaDoc in theory. So I assume you can you, know, uh, you mm-hmm. can tell them why it is like it is and what you know which uh, which choices they have and which consequences they 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 will get doing this in this way transactions optimistic locking or whatever. This is a never ending mm-hmm. story actually persistence. Okay, nice. So your first. Product was the book. Can we still buy your book? Is it available? Yes, it is. It's still available in a digital uh, form. Mm-hmm. It's also available on Amazon, okay. on all Amazon uh, uh, portals. And uh, it's still selling. To the date, still uh, selling quite yeah, of course. well. I would and say. what yeah. is the table of contents? So what's, what's inside? Is it like JDBC, JPA, or is it just hybrid? Exactly. It's exactly as you said. It is the first part is about JDBC and mm-hmm. database essential, but the basics. Uh, then the second part is about JP and Hibernate, and the mm-hmm. last part is about uh, Juke. It's a smaller part about Juke as an alternative, uh, either an alternative or you know as uh, one technology that you can even mix and get the most of both. The J O O Q. This is what what what. Yes, you... Juke. It's yeah, uh, yeah the the, uh, the product built by Lucas Eder, if you know. Yeah, Lucas Eder, a nice guy. Yeah, yeah I met him several times and. Various conferences. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. And so this was your first product. The next product was what? Was the video courses? And you have an on site yes, training. And on site training is not yes, a, exactly it. like product, it's more almost like consulting. So you have to go there and yes. deliver the course, right? Yeah. Yes, but you, it's still a product because yeah, you have to build. You have to build the slides uh, to build the agenda, the material. You know, the GitHub repository, everything. So in a way, you have to invest uh, time. Yeah. Uh, before, be- before, in order to create something, you cannot just go there and teach people without having uh, any material at all. That yeah. would be only consulting. But uh, you have to have everything structured to follow an agenda. So yes, it's it, in a way. I, I, that's why I, I see it as a product because you invest some time uh, initially and afterwards as well, and then you deliver it, and then. You you get uh, the revenue. You get more revenue than the time that you invested. Yeah. Ideally, that's yeah. how hopefully. any product. Works. <laughs> oh, hopefully, oh, and hopefully, ho- yeah, hopefully. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, so and that was uh, the, the those were my my next products, and then I created a new training about SQL, high performance SQL, which oh, I'm now doing also online. Mm-hmm. Yes, I'm doing it uh, online, and uh, I will. Uh, and this one, I also plan on writing a new book about it based okay. on the same uh, material. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I also have a software product. Yeah, I actually created a library. I created a, a, a library which you can use. You can you configure it in your application, and it tells you what you are doing wrong with Hibernate. What configurations you did not set or you set wrongly. What mappings you are using. Uh, you are not using uh, the right way, or you should avoid, or which one you should uh, use instead. Uh, also, it monitors how much time it takes for the session, how much time it takes for the flush queries, how it monitors how many items are being returned. So if it uh, detects that it, you are selecting a lot of data, it uh, triggers and tells you that uh, you're uh, you're probably doing something wrong here. <laughs> oh, okay. So, yeah, but, so uh, what way, is it? Is it is it like a wrapper around Hibernate? So you have to install, you know... Yes, you... It's, it's like a wrapper. It's like a wrapper. It's just like an API. It's, like, it's a library. Mm-hmm. So it's, you can... Con- programmatically, you can configure it in your application. It's meant mostly for the testing part, for mm-hmm. the integration tests, because that's you. you that's where you yeah, want course. to get it right. You don't want to test it in production. And uh, it's called High Persistence Optimizer. That's High Persistence the name Optimizer. Of the so and you can just download yeah. the product, install it on Hibernate. And what is the output? Is it like HTML or logs or what you get out of that? Actually, it's uh, it's programmatic. You can you can get all the events. You can get it in the logs, but you can also get access to it uh, in uh, in Java and then parse it, st- use it as a stream, parse it, aggregate it, do whatever you want with okay, it, and cool. integrate. And actually, one one of the nicest things about it is is that uh, you you have access to it from Java, so you can fail your build if mm-hmm. you detect one issue. 
So what what's inter- what's nice about it? Once you fix all those issues, if someone comes and modifies something and breaks something which affects performance, you will you you they will uh, break the build because hypersistence optimizer will detect yeah. that something has changed and it will throw that. Uh, uh, throw an event and then you can fail the build on an event that yeah. you don't recognize. So f- f- funny or uh, yeah, somehow interesting story. A long time ago, so it was uh, mm-hmm. a time it was two thousand two or three. So it was a huge Ooh. project with persistence and back then with container managed persistence or entity beans. This was before mm-hmm, JPA, mm-hmm. and we used yeah. Xdoclet for uh, and what the Xdoclet did it generated deployment descriptors and in the deployment descriptors mm-hmm. there were no the transaction levels which you can use annotations right now like transactional or Transaction mm-hmm. attribute, and back then it was in deployment descriptor. And what we did, mm-hmm. we have the facades, and the facade started the transaction, and the transaction was passed, you know, to the backend to the Oracle database back then. And uh, mm-hmm. but we read mostly. And what the architect did without telling us, he deactivated the uh, transactions directly in the deployment descriptors and not in Xdoclet. And the deployment descriptors were generated, and the mm-hmm. Xdoclet was checked in. So because uh, there was pointless, you know, to check in generated code. And, uh, mm-hmm. and he, he thought there's like, you know, final optimization and it, we went production and the performance was just, you know, broke down. It, we were about 10 times slower than before. And what turned out <laughs> that the database, you know, for every small SQL statement, for every select started a yeah, new, a mini, new connection. mini transaction. Mini, mini transaction. transaction, yes, auto-commit mode. Yeah, and it, and it took like two milliseconds and there were lots of SQL statements. So um, the entire thing took instead, I don't know, 10 seconds, like two or three minutes. And we searched a, lo- a long time because I couldn't believe that, you know, the deployment descriptors were modified. I, I, I took a look at the Xdoclet level and this Xdoclet, I don't know whether you know it, it looks like Javadoc back then. But yeah, this was, yes, I know. It was Javadoc. Yeah, it was Javadoc, was... the Doclet, uh, the EJB Doclet. It looked mm-hmm. like exactly, the, it looked like Java annotations right now, but in Javadoc. So with your mm-hmm. tool, you could find it immediately because you will break the build, right? But back then, there's also a funny story because I don't know why. Everyone, you know, tries to optimize the performance just by deactivating transactions. And I say, look, the JTA transactions, mm-hmm. they do not cost anything. What you have to be more careful, you know, the database transactions. This is what we have to think about when we hit the database. Just starting transactions mm-hmm. in a thread is like a marking a thread as transactional or not, right? So, yes, sometimes uh, some, sometimes it's, uh, things happen. But mostly, you know, the, the, the reason why, uh, why I wanted to, to write this is in a way to automate uh, the job that I'm doing when probably I'm when I'm doing consulting, you know, because I have companies who uh, they complain about the performance of yeah. their systems, yeah, and uh, I I just take a look and uh, review their code and tell them, okay, you should change this, this, and this, and in a way, using this tool, you can just put it, uh, install it in your code, and it will tell automatically. And what's nice, it, it can it, it does this on every commit; it can check automatically, so you don't have to hire someone mm-hmm. uh, to to check the, those uh, nice. manually. So that was the idea. Nice idea, mm-hmm. actually. And any other products yeah, you have? So, uh, so, I mean, products which no, you can download. No, uh, this is the uh, no, this is the only product that I'm actually creating and selling it. It's a commercial product. I have other open source products. Yeah, which which are, which are they? Available. So, just talk about your products. I'm really curious what you did. Yeah, those yeah, there are those are also products. Are they are just open source? That's uh, the only difference. Yeah. So, uh, the most uh, let's say the the most uh, popular one is called Hibernate Types, and it uh, provides uh, many uh, additional uh, oh. types like JSON array for durations, uh, store, and uh, for IP addresses, if you want to map an IP address to the PostgreSQL uh, um, nice idea. Uh, I know mm-hmm. for column type. Yes. Uh, so it, it provides all these and uh, some other utilities as well, like some nice uh, result transformers, which allow you to uh, use functional interfaces and get map, get them uh, or extract uh, um, extract better results from uh, from me, so this is the most uh, popular. Uh, it is it, it is quite popular because it has on um, Maven Central last month. I think I it it, it got like uh, over fifty hundred thousand uh, wow. downloads per month. So it is quite popular. Yes, and the next one is uh, is a tool that I wrote uh, some five or six years ago. It's called FlexiPool, and it allows you to monitor the connection pools. It has adapters for the most common connection pools, mm-hmm. uh, like uh, um, 
C3PO, uh, Hikari or DDCP and uh, DDCP2 and uh, Actually, all the common Tom, yesterday Tom Cat, yeah. yesterday someone asked me they have a Whitefly and uh, the Ahex TV someone asked me they have um, mm -hmm. Whitefly and uh, connection pool and sometimes the connections are broken whether they can do something mm -hmm. about that and there is a reconnect you know period and you can have a health mm -hmm. check SQL statements yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah and um, yeah I could actually uh, your pool would be also an answer for that you know to have provide additional capabilities to monitor what's going on inside inside mm -hmm. uh, Whitefly native well, connection pools, right? Yes, uh, the real advantage, because for, for Wildfly, they have, uh, they, they build monitoring and application servers yeah, exactly. and some stuff that uh, that can help you. But uh, actually, the, the advantage for this one is that it, it, you can use it to realize, uh, to, to figure out what is the best, uh, what is the proper size to give mm -hmm. to your connection pool. Because this there is no mathematical equation you can provide. Actually, there is, but it doesn't, you cannot apply it. We learned it about it in school, actually, at telecommunication. Erlang developed uh, de developed the equation and the queuing theory. How you can actually uh, get the number, the, the optimal numbers of servers to for for a given, uh, let's say, um, uh, if you if you know exactly what is uh, the number of requests that come to your system and the duration they are using the system. But actually, the problem is that the latencies in computers uh, systems are not uh, are not like in telecommunication networks where you have uh, fiber optics or copper cables and, you know, the latency is always the same. You don't have interferences. Mm -hmm. But in computers, you have a lot of interferences because you have, yeah. you know, some packet, packets are dropped, you have virtualizations. Garbage uh, collection. Or you're running your... Garbage collection. Some you are running your application, and then in the same instance, uh, maybe you are running on cloud, and someone else is running something. Yeah, else. but at least let's and say if, if you have uh, stealing the resources. If we have an mm -hmm. I/O heavy uh, application, and we have let's say a monolithic application running, let's say in Whitefly. So what you should happen at least is that the number of connection pools, the max max number of connections uh, in in typical synchronous request response application, should be the same as the number of uh, incoming uh, threats, right? So if I have let's say. Uh, five EGBs or five request scoped or five bulkheads, five parallel threads, I will get five connections. And in an ideal case, I will need five connections because, you know, threads become transaction and transaction becomes connection, right? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, if you, yes, but usually you have more requests, uh, more, yeah. more requests. Like for in Tomcat, you can have 100, 200 uh, con uh, yeah. concurrent requests and you, you cannot have 100 connections uh, on the database side in Postgres. You are right, instance, but, but, uh, but are the connection, processes. but the connection, the number of connections uh, it's the same mm -hmm. as the number of uh, incoming, uh, how it's called, uh, incoming request thread pools. So all mm -hmm. application yeah, servers yeah. have... If have, you have a thread pool. Yeah, if you have yes, a thread yes, pool, yeah. exactly. This has to match. And anything else, you know, the queuing is then other problem because you have usually the yeah. queue before the thread pool. This is what usually happens. Okay, mm -hmm. nice. So this was your your uh, thread pool, pro uh, uh, sorry, connection pool product, right? So do you have anything yes, else? It's, a, it's an option. So yes, I have some other products, but are more like learning. Like uh, you know, those are some repositories. Oh, okay. which, uh, Like uh, there is a repository which is uh, um, is actually linked to the book and to the courses, and it's also available online. Yeah, okay, and, but this uh, is not... I use mostly for examples. So I'm more excited about product like you know what I can download. So yeah. you, you're right. They're, they're like you know by, those, by, those, by... those two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Great. those two are mostly yeah. It's uh, it's uh, everything I told you is already too much work. Even if I don't work, uh, even if I don't work a full-time job, uh, it's already too much. Right. And, and are you happy with the freelancing decision? So it's go, go, you enjoy the time? Yes. Yes, I'm enjoying the time. Not only that, for it's uh, fi from a financial a financial uh, perspective, it's much more advantageous. But I I uh, I have the flexibility of creating uh, my agenda and uh, um, you know doing the work whenever I can. So especially now that I have uh, I have kids, so I need a uh, much more flexibility when it comes yeah. to, to my schedule, you know, drive them to school, back from school, and then to uh, sometimes go to the doctor and all sorts of things yeah. that uh, you don't have them if you are working a fixed schedule, you have to go from nine to five or something like that. Yeah. I, uh, I ask yeah, you because I get yeah, lots of such questions. People ask me, you know, uh, you are a freelancer. Should I also become a freelancer? Listen, this is hard to tell because it's a complete different story, yeah. you know. You, you, you are probably working even more, but you, you are more, more flexible and some people li like it and some people really hate it. And what I remember at the beginning of my freelance thing, because I become accidentally freelancer, but it was 1997. Mm -hmm. The first three years, I was 1997 to 2001 or something like this. I was really, really nervous, you know, because for me, it was like almost like a jobless situation. I had some contracts, but I didn't. And this was like, you know, 
constant head age, but right now I really enjoy it. So after all these years, in worst case, I would just take vacations, you know. <laughs> so this is what... Yeah, yeah, well, you have to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. You I have, have to... it. I have, but it's really hard. I get so many requests. This is uh, this is a constant stream of interesting projects. This is my problem, you know. The only problem is time. Mm -hmm. This is this is what's, what's, what's the problem actually is. Yes. Well, I try to... You know, you know, I I also like to do that, but I try to move away from from that consulting part because I I believe that uh, if you create a product and you invest some time in it, you can get much more revenue out of it yeah, than the, doing consulting because doing consulting is just trading time for yeah, money. You're right, but, but the danger is yes. if you if you know just do teaching, you will forget about the real world problems. So I think the main driver. No, right, I'm I, I'm using Stack Overflow for that. Oh, ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> This is also so I'm answering Stack Overflow questions, so I get, I get in, I, I know what people are uh, this is struggling with. Interesting strategy. Interesting Overflow. strategy. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Listen, uh, suggestion. So uh, we just, you know, call it a podcast, so we stop recording here. But okay. I would like to invite you in one time in the future, if you have time, you know, and just talk yeah, about sure. mistakes and uh, pers high performance persistence. So a little bit about, you know, okay. my experiences, your experiences, what went wrong in projects. If you're interested, um, I would really appreciate it. Of that. course. Yeah. Yes, yes, we sure we can. Uh, we can whenever you have time. Yeah, sure. We, uh, in a few weeks. Now is my you know uh, I'm I'm completely overloaded with project requests, but I, I would really like to do it because you know we already did the introduction, and now we can fully focus mm -hmm. on a topic, and this would be just fun. Yeah, exactly. Now uh, we can do something that people will uh, actually they can get a lot of uh, info even from this and a lot of tips. Yeah, yeah and this is all sorts of usually things. people have, have to know something. you first, you know, have to know you first, and now yeah. we can talk about whatever you like. Yeah, sure. Yes, exactly. That would be a great. Uh, that would be a great idea to to share our experiences related yeah. to performance, you know, data access performance from JDBC to Juke, and we just talk, you know, from, through transactions, exactly. whatever. This would be a, a nice part. Exactly, and and it's nice because I also when when I started working, I was working with JDBC. Then I moved and I worked with uh, Java E. Exactly. And, uh, you know, you know, let's go through history and see what we've learned. Yeah. All uh, from uh, you know. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you and. See you Thank in you. upcoming podcast. Okay, looking forward to it.